Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're doing well. My name is Marla Tori, and I run the Funky Sport platform. Today, I want to introduce you to someone that is near and dear to my heart and to my brain. This is my former professor, just lifelong mentor and friend. I would like to introduce you folks to Dr. Evangeline Linkus, who is the Associate Professor for the University of South Florida's Urban and Regional Planning Department. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Um, so she's just such a powerhouse, just not just in academia, but in the community. I also want to celebrate the fact that you recently got tenure, so congratulations. <laughs> it's, it's, that's a big deal. So mm -hmm. you worked very hard for that, and proud of you. So um, we're just going to take this time just to get to know who you are, what your role and your background is, and also what you're doing in terms of food systems. So let me just start. So first, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and why you decided to become an urban planning professor? Because that's very intriguing. Sure. So um, I, I grew up in Florida. I grew up in Sarasota, Florida, um, and really did note um, some of the changes that were going on um, in the course of the 80s, 90s, watching my environment change in Florida, and um, just was really interested in this. It's the way that, that we should grow, and, and I watched my street go from horse pasture and states where I saw wildlife all the time to kind of strip mall development, yeah. um, really um, housing that wasn't maintained well. Sure. And so I think I, you know, I think um, my decision to go into urban planning dates all the way back to just kind of looking at my environment as someone who grew up in Florida during a time of a lot of rapid growth. Sure. Um, but my path was meandering. I've always loved literature. Okay. So I have a, an undergraduate degree in English and actually wrote my um, bachelor's thesis at New College about the city in Japanese novels and its portrayal. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so there was always that urban element um, and found my way to New York City after that. Worked um, at, in a whole different kind of environment. I worked in advertising, copywriting in New York. And I think most people will tell you if there is one valuable skill for a planner, it's writing and communicating. So I draw on those skills all the time. Um, and then through a you know kind of a, a meandering path, I ended up in Philadelphia, okay. um, where I did my master's and PhD in urban planning at the University of Pennsylvania. And so there, um, I think there were kind of dual experiences going on where I, uh, my dissertation chair, Thomas Daniels, who a lot of folks are familiar with, fairly well known um, in planning academia and practice for his work on growth management and food systems and farmland preservation in particular. So I was studying under his, him, learning a lot about farmland preservation sure. and local food systems. And then I had the, the amazing, um, outside my door, Pennsylvania countryside and Pennsylvania oh, right. farm country oh. and farm stands. And I, I did start to think about, there's not um, the same level of fresh produce readily available in Florida. And over time, as I came back to Florida, um, realizing it had more of a wholesale tradition, larger sure. scale farming. But I did start asking questions um, about why my experience in Florida and Pennsylvania were so different. So um, while doing my PhD, I worked for the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, got to be involved in a lot of farmland preservation, rural and agricultural planning there. Um, then ended up coming back to Florida and ended up at Sarasota County Extension where I was the director of um, their office which has all kinds of different programs, some of which um, relate directly to food systems um, and a lot to community planning. So got involved with um, sustainable agriculture programs, um, small scale kind of market farming, wow. enterprise training, uh, local food system, education, community garden uh, involvement, how governance issues, sure. and, and kind of trying to grow those programs. So really did a whole suite of hands-on and applied work in Sarasota County Extension. After a few years there, ended up at USF. Wow. <laughs> and um, now, we, now I treat the issue more from an academic perspective. Um, so it went from more of an applied practice sure. perspective in my planning and extension roles. And now uh, my research really looks at 
urban rural interfaces, sure. how our, um, lar large areas that are growing rapidly uh, look at how they are going to treat their rural and agricultural lands. Are they going to decide to develop them? Are they going to keep them yeah. in agricultural uses? And how, how are those uses changing and impacting land uses in rural and agricultural areas? Um, so it's the career has, has kind of wound from sort of a, just my own personal experiences sure. to professional and now to academic. Wow, thank you. I'm very inspired. I, I mean, I think just kind of hearing your story and like kind of looking at maybe some of those beginning roots, it almost sounds like in some ways, correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of went into playing almost out of frustration, just kind of seeing like a lot of sprawl. Can I? Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I feel like a person who remembers what old Florida is like. Grew up with old Florida sure. in my backyard, and and there is that nostalgia for that. And yet now I'm I'm trained to kind of understand some of these these processes. Oh, sure. Of change are necessary and important, and some really could have you could have done better. Oh, of course. <laughs> so, I understand. Yeah. Um, so you know, one thing that you talked about was throughout this academic and professional journey of yours you eventually got into doing work that was pertaining to food systems planning, especially looking at agricultural land. So was there something before you got connected to your professor that got you interested in looking at planning through the lens of food? That's a good question, and I think it's probably as simple as um, a love of open space, a love of nature. Um, so much of, especially in Pennsylvania, so many rural and open spaces are agricultural yeah. spaces. Um, in Florida, that's a little different, and certainly it doesn't look um, like rural and agricultural space when you see open space in sure. Florida, even though many times it is, because um, ranch land, yeah. so we just have a very different landscape for agriculture. We don't have all the small scenic farms with the red barns that Pennsylvania oh, has. Sure. Um, but, but we've got cattle ranching, we've got orange groves, we've got, we have uh, agriculture at a really different scale and a different appearance, at least in South and Central Florida. As we get into North Florida, a little bit more oh. of a smaller scale farming um, is more prevalent. Um, so. Um, but I think it's really uh, sort of a, a tradition that um, actually it's big at the University of Pennsylvania where Ian McHarg, um, Design with Nature, worked. But this tradition of thinking about the land, uh, resources, and open space, and um, I think I felt it was following in the footsteps sure. of the tradition at the school in many ways and just a love of nature that I also had. Absolutely. Well, you know, one thing that I talk about throughout the course of the Funky Sport platform, and as you'll notice, is that I'm highlighting various players involved within our food systems processes. But let's step back before we really delve any further. Dr. V, can you define for us what exactly does food systems mean? What 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 does that mean in your um, perspective? It, food systems, I think it is a pretty simple definition. It's all of the enterprises and activities that go into uh, bringing food to the table and then beyond. So it's it's the production or the growth of the food, the packaging, sure, uh, manufacturing for prepared foods, uh, and then even how it gets into the compost or the trash. So it's the full system of how food is handled. Yeah. So basically from sea to waste. It is. Mm -hmm. Really looking at basically that beginning and end and almost like it's really looking at the life cycle of food. It is. And I think why why that's become it important is because people um, want to feel that they understand the all the sugar sure. parts, that they understand that there are environmental and climate Absolutely. components of these things, that there are social and equity um, parts of these of some of these different components. So breaking down what, what each different part of the system sure. looks like has become uh, really important as people want their food to represent their values, Absolutely. to have nutritional value, and, and feel connected to their local community. So and that's why I think that's become so important. I think I, like when I think about what you just said, um, a lot of consumers are looking for labels such as fair trade or um, certified organic or locally grown. So to me, that kind of connects to some of these overarching values that um, I would say consumers or just the general public has. Or maybe there's some kind of nostalgic connection people may have. Maybe like if you're Latino, maybe Goya crackers. There's some kind of, it may not necessarily be local, mm -hmm. but there was this kind of nostalgic nuance to what the food is that we may happen to be eating. So, yeah. yeah, and I think the local movement too is a big part of oh, um, sure. why food systems matter more. People want to 
um, understand what kind of food grows in their area. And yeah. many people may have, may have not have been familiar sure. with that prior to this movement. Um, they want to know who's, um, they understand the economic impact sure. of supporting local farmers. Um, so I think that's yeah, really, and that that's and then understanding what happens to their food and how it affects their community. Absolutely. So kind of going, digging in a little bit, um, we're talking about you know what food system is, but now let's look at planning. And my question is, you know, what exactly is food systems planning? How do you define? that from an urban planning lens? Oh, well, planning, as you know, yes. uh, is a big field with a lot of different um, components. So planning tries to look at the whole entire system of how communities function. So food it actually inserts itself into so many sure. different aspects of that, whether it's the transportation of food, health, um, uh, civic and social kinds of um, decision making and policy. So there are so many different aspects to this. So for a long time, I think traditionally um, planning and, and certainly the way I was trained as a planner, we looked at food systems from agricultural and rural lands perspective. Sure. We looked at it primarily as a rural land use issue and there was a lot of focus on rural land preservation and if you look even at like the smart growth movement or some of the sure. bigger movements in planning, they're really looking at how do you preserve rural land. So what's changed in the last few years that I think is really interesting is all the other conversations that have come into the food landscape. So you have small and local food farmers, so that's not necessarily about preserving land um, at the large scale in the rural areas, but how do you intermingle farming activities into yeah. urban space and suburban space and at the fringe? Um, what are the different kinds of land use decisions that go into that? Um, there's been some really interesting stuff in Florida um, in the last year or two, um, led by some folks in St. Pete about whether we need to change our right to farm laws to accommodate farming in urban areas. So there's a whole suite of, of different issues just from that sort of land use perspective that have changed um, from rural to urban. Uh, food sovereignty, I think, is kind of an interesting um, new issue that planners can really, um, planners can get more involved in. It's a little bit outside of the traditional wheelhouse of land use and planning, um, but that's about sort of the community's self determination and their rights to and their right to kind of make their own decisions about food. So. Um, for a long time, it was it was a really important issue, and, and it's not not important anymore. But it, um, thinking about food deserts was sure. really a really big topic in food planning. Thinking about and a food desert is a space where there's um, a geographical space where there may not be um, convenient access to fresh and healthy food. Yeah. So um, uh, there was and that so however has been was defined. As a grocery store, yeah. and maybe that's not the relevant food source for sure. all cultures and all yeah. communities. So, we're rethinking that from the sort of sovereignty perspective, how, um, how, what's culturally appropriate, and thinking about the choice sure. that individuals want to make um, for their food. So, planners have had to be a little bit more complex in thinking about policy from that perspective. Um, so, health is a huge. Um, Part of the food story that planners can get involved in, um, and that that's you know thinking about community gardens. It's not only yet, um, someone's ability to kind of go out and harvest fresh food, but the, the physical exercise that's yes. involved. There's a connection yeah. there. So um, it, it's it's a tough question to to answer. Um, yeah. Transportation, how far food travels, yeah. planners play a role in that because there are so many facets. Absolutely. So, yeah. Traditionally, you know, we looked at the land use issues, but I think we. We've decided that there's so much more to it. Absolutely. And I think just kind of coming from this, I think for those of you that may know, or for those of you that don't know, my background is in urban planning, both my academic and my professional background. So definitely bringing some of these perspectives into this conversation. And I will say, just kind of to insert, uh, what I specifically dealt with um, prior to my venture with Monkey Spork was doing um, zoning related matters when it came to um, cities and spe specifically our municipal perspectives. So I think some things that just kind of come to mind on how food can intersect, so please chime in, are um, when you're looking at zoning, you're looking at how is it that land can be used. So similarly to land use, but it gets very specific on what kind of codes and what kind of regulations come into mind and come into play. So it could be something as far as what are the zoning ordinances what does the code say about what a zoning district can do and how they can regulate 
maybe how a front yard garden can be grown or where a grocery store can be located. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the front yard gardens are, are a big issue. Um, yeah. In Sarasota, I ran into, there was a rooftop garden. Oh, okay. That wasn't allowed by zoning. Oh, wow. Uh, I think that still remains um, non-complying. Chickens, that yes. there chickens yeah. are big. I have so much diversity in the way different local governments in Florida address that issue. I live in Temple Terrace and um, their backyard chickens are not allowed, but we're adjacent to the city of Tampa where they are allowed. Um, yeah, so the, the Florida legislature last year dealt with um, uh, kind of preempted local governments and, and there's good and bad in this from uh, regulating the the production of vegetables on their yard. So no longer can a local government say you can't produce, um, grow vegetables in your front yard. However, there's, and that's a good thing, I think, yeah. in general, but um, some of the pushback is the way that that legislation was worded uh, limits the ability of local governments to regulate local food systems. So if, if a local government wants to add additional elements like encouraging organic, yeah, that can be more difficult after this ordinance. Sure, um, but in general, local governments really do have a, uh, have a lot of discretion about how they uh, regulate food systems Absolutely. through zoning. Um, and there's there are some really tough questions about um, the one that I look at in my research the most. Um, uh, it's pretty well accepted that outside urban growth areas yeah. you should encourage agriculture. Um, so outside of the urban core, allow farm animals, allow um, sometimes. Um, somewhat um, noxious baby kinds of or nuisance potentially issues like spraying of, of pesticides, herbicides, um, spreading of manure. So farm uses um, aren't always the friendliest um, sure. neighbor kinds of uses. So what what's appropriate today in the urban context when we do want to encourage urban agriculture? Most sure. people think that's a great thing, but which of those you know which kinds of farm practices are appropriate? Should yeah. it be organic if it's in urban areas? Does that matter, or is it really about the smell, the ability to track whether um, yeah. it will attract animals and how waste is treated, what kind of buildings are on the property, um, whether it um, uh, fits with the surrounding landscape. So there's, those are all issues that the zoning code um, will address and that are, are, are fairly complex and each community um, has different perspectives on what's appropriate for them. I agree. So for those of you folks that are probably sitting there wondering, well, what does my Cuban sandwich have to do with zoning or urban planning? There's a lot that comes into that Cuban sandwich, so <laughs> definitely something to consider and something to think about that there definitely are a lot of interworkings. And I think another example that I thought of was economic development, and that's yeah. a huge slice of urban planning as well. And there's definitely a lot of nuances when it comes to, and you can probably speak more, especially when you look at ag and the economic impact that agriculture and just the food industry has for the state of Florida. Yeah, think. my mind goes first to all the food production and agriculture. Oh, sure. But, um, you, you bring up an excellent point of economic development, which I usually think of in terms of more like bricks and mortar businesses, um, innovation and startup kind of businesses, sure. like the, the big example being food trucks. Oh, yeah. Um, so they, this ability to kind of help um, nurture local business development through um, promoting the local food system is something funky sport. <laughs> fabulous ad, but also local planners um, can get involved in. So I'm really familiar with the um, city of Tampa's experiments with them, with, with um, promoting food trucks as a form of economic development and downtown promotion. Um, so the mayor's Gaslight Park under Mayor Buckhorn um, was an attempt to not compete with the local downtown businesses. So they carefully um, allowed the food trucks just in a select area on certain days. Yeah. Very aware that they, they didn't want to compete with the bricks and mortar businesses, but they did want to create energy around these businesses, energy around this, new down, this downtown location. And so they brought the food trucks in and some of those um, led to new bricks and mortar businesses. Wow, that's definitely incredible. So that kind of segues into another question I have. So you know, we are talking about these overarching concepts of food systems planning from a very 101 broad perspective. Um, just from some of the research you've done, maybe just from some of your connections with fellow planning colleagues, are there any kind of examples you can think of from maybe local or regional efforts of different agencies or jurisdictions aside from Tampa working or intermingling food systems within their scope of um, agency work? Yeah, at this point I feel like all, um, 
our majority of local governments are trying this in some way, shape, yeah. or form. So um, this could look like anything from a food uh, section of a comprehensive plan. Okay. Um, for a while, Sarasota County was looking at doing that and debating whether that should go into the all sections of the comprehensive plan, or if it could be a standalone section, or if it should go in the land use section. So, um, you yeah, know, that's one example, but I think um, St. Pete is enormously active and has shown real uh, leadership in this particular region on thinking about urban food um, and how uh, to promote good policy on that. Uh, another um, example in this region um, is Pasco, um, sorry, yeah, Pasco County, yeah. and I think of Newport Ritchie, um, oh, yeah. leadership coming out of Newport Ritchie um, and affiliated with USF yeah. that have done um, created an urban agriculture ordinance yes. there. Um, so I'll, I, I, I'd say most cities are grappling with this sure. in some way, shape, or form. Which is good. It's, it's definitely in the right direction. There's a couple local players I can think of that I come to mind, especially Newport Ritchie, but that's, it, it's all wonderful. So I think just my kind of final question to wrap everything up. Um, so what can the everyday person or citizen that's really interested and passionate about either local food movement or just food and they want to get involved within this decision making process, what are maybe some two or three words of advice that you have for either local citizen or resident or any other kind of um, local stakeholder that wants to somehow find a way to get involved in food systems planning, what can they do from a practical level because unfortunately not everyone can afford to go to grad school to go into planning or has the ability, but I feel like there are many ways that everyday people can get involved within this process. So are there maybe two or three examples you can think of? Well, the most important thing is to support your local farmers because we're not all going to be local farmers. We're all not going to write local food policy and we don't need to. We just need to support the farmers who are doing that work. So go shop at your local farm stands and um, and find out, ask the questions so that you know um, what you're buying, whether it's locally grown. I have the pleasure of living in Temple Terrace and I have to give a shout out to the Temple Terrace Farmers Market. Um, which is just um, a hosted has hosted Funky Spore awesome. for uh, educational training and is all around awesome. But when I shop there, um, they have policies in place so I know that I'm buying local. And I love that farmers market. If that's not um, something that's in your neck of the woods, usually there's a, you can find a CSA. But I'd say that the number one best thing you can do is support your local food community, and that doesn't have to be. Um, Produce. It could be beer, it could be wine, it could be um, bread. Uh, so find um, the local vendors and um, be part of that and support them so that they can stay in business. I think that's you know the biggest thing. But then I think following your path, you know, everyone's individual passion. Whether you want to actually garden, get involved in a community garden, um, would you, do you want to go try different foods on the weekend? Uh, but Get yourself out involved and educated, and I think um, just that, that creates a learning environment to, to be more active over time. It's great. I feel very inspired. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your My time. Pleasure. Thank you so much for being here, folks. If you want to learn more about Dr. Linkus and the academic work she's doing in food systems planning, or you want to get in touch with her, I will have her contact information listed below, and I will also have a link to USF's urban and regional planning department and program. There's a lot of great research coming out of that department, so I definitely recommend you go ahead and um, check out some of the work that they're doing. But anyway, that's all we have for now. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you.